Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I am Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators, and we've been working for about the last 25 years, and we've worked with just about every major publisher and publication in the business. We've also together published around 50 books, and we've all taught illustration at universities. Yep. Each week, we're going to tackle a different subject uh, relating to illustration from each of our three perspectives. Sometimes we're going to agree. Sometimes we're going to argue. But hopefully, you're going to learn something new. All right. Uh, how are you guys doing? Awesome. It's been a while, hasn't it? No, I'm just, <laughs> been a, just kidding. We a just, while. <laughs> just talked yesterday. Um, <laughs> I wanted to point out something that we sort of dropped off doing this the last few podcasts, and that was... Um, what have you guys been working on? So can we just do like a quick update on what, what's on your guys' plate? I'm, I'm curious to know what you guys are doing. Lee said you, uh, you were working on a book today. So let's do that, and then we'll we'll go into the rest of the episode. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, Lee, what are you doing? I am working on a book, like, <laughs> like you just said. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm writing two of them at the same time. And my agent just went to Bologna, which is a huge uh, children's book convention every year. It happens in the spring. So if you guys mm-hmm. want a tax-deductible trip to Italy, anyone can book a trip <laughs> and go to this book fair in Bologna. I, I've been um, wanting to go to that for years. I just Me it, too. It always sneaks up on me. I always forget about it until it's too late. I think I'm going to do it next year. Um, but anyway, my agent took one of my manuscripts there, and I had some sketches and some paintings and stuff. So I got a lot of interest from this one story that I'm doing. So I'm now dummying up that one to a complete dummy with some revisions and then working mm-hmm. on another one. And I'm going to try to sell a two book deal because as we've said before on the podcast, there's nothing worse than somebody having just one idea. Mm-hmm. And so even if they don't buy both of them, I want to have at least two on tap just in case. Right. Smart. Cool. What about you, Will? I am working with two or three, well, three different, four different teachers uh, at SVS to create classes. Um, Some of them are really close, some of them are far off, but very exciting. And I'm working on a character design job for a board game company and working on a children's book, sequel to Bonaparte. Cool. I am am currently working on a new uh, figure design class for SVS. I have like 10, I ordered all of, I, I have my archive of life drawing books or, or anatomy books, but then I ordered like all the best ones that Amazon had like highest rate ratings on. I've been going through these books, looking at like, why is this book so good? What's bad about this book? And crafting like a uh, outline, a curriculum for the class that I think um, uses the best stuff from all these different books. So that's been that's been a lot of fun. And then the next thing, I'm doing a sequel to S- Snowplow, the little snowplow. So I'm working on Snowplow 2. And I just got a uh, a book deal for another sequel. I don't did I mention that earlier on this podcast? I can't, it's been a while, but another uh, sequel for what? A, a, a sequel for another children's book that I'd originally done uh, years ago. So those are the Which things. one? Oh, uh, I can't. It's not it's announced yet. Secret. I can't. I can't say. Oh, but the but the first one is is already made. The first one came out several years ago, and the author contacted me. He's like, "Would you be up for a sequel?" To oh, this I know book? which one it is. And I was like, "Yeah, that'd be cool." And so we both uh, told our, I guess, our agents, and they went and worked something out. And now there's a there's a book deal in the works. So. It should, what it I should love be about funded. that is that you guys didn't wait around for the publisher to say, hey, what about a second book? You guys kind of took the initiative. Yeah. And, you know, something we talk about a lot on this show is like, hey, I got this image or this story. Mm-hmm. Who's Who might want it? <laughs> and what can we do? And I forgot to mention, <laughs> I guess I'm just like so ready to to move on to these next projects. I Yesterday, uh, I sent all the last files for Skyheart to the printer. So what? that that book is out of my hands. It's in China. They're 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 piecing it together, doing whatever they do over there, and and I should have books 
back here in a few months. So nice. How many copies did you order? About three thousand. Yeah. We'll see. I, I still have to do a pre order. I guess by the time people listen to this, the pre order will have launched. So if if more people want it than that, then I'll order extra. So well, just so you guys know, listening at home, thinking of doing your own Kickstarter, a book, a hardcover book, weighs a little over a pound, typically. I mean, obviously, it changes depending on the actual dimensions, but around a pound. So that's the reason I was asking Jake, because that was the big shocker when I did my book, is all mm-hmm. of a sudden, I, I did 2,000, and now 2,000 pounds worth of books are coming mm-hmm. my way. And that was the first time I just stopped and were like, oh my gosh, where, where am yeah. I going to store what, these things? What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> we had, luckily we had a room in our basement that was empty and we just stacked, this was for my first uh, Kickstarter book, the Antler Boy. And we just stacked these books and like made a giant couch out of them. And I mean like a giant couch, like a 30 foot long couch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> out of the books. All right. I One more thing before we get into Will's topic. Uh, we, I got a letter this morning from someone who had some to say about back in episode three ship happens. They, uh, they had a really thoughtful commentary on that that I wanted to share. And I got permission from him to share this. His name is Mike. And I don't think he left any like social media on this. So here's Mike's letter. There's something I kept thinking uh, would come up in the Ship Happens episode, and maybe it's not a concept that resonates with you guys because you're all professionals and have, quote-unquote, made it and are loving the work. But I think for a lot of artists out there, myself included, I went through all the steps of making it, had an art job, and kind of hated it. I went through a long period after my first couple of art jobs ended, not wanting to apply, not knowing why my drive was so low. It turns out that for me, and I imagine a lot of other artists, that making our art our job might not be the best step for us. I'm getting far more productivity and enjoyment out of creating now that art is officially my hobby. I do a weekly webcomic. I do art for a board game company. I engage with my following of fans, my little following of fans, and I have not been this happy with my art since college. So for a lot of your followers, it may be a good message to hear that killing yourself to flounder in the shallow end of the professional artist career isn't A, always going to pay off, and B, making it doesn't equate to success or happiness. The Ship Happens episode seemed to really resonate with me because it highlighted that I needed to find my own personal goals and stick to them. I had to admit to myself I'd never be happy in working on other people's stuff, and that was a dead end for a professional artist. Uh, following my dream would have meant a career I hated and might not have realized it until I was years and years into it. Turns out my my dream was more like having a stable income outside of the art industry that let me do whatever I wanted artistically in my spare time. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it works for me. I'd love to hear what you think or if something like that ever becomes one of your topics. Love your work. Love your projects. Thanks so much for being uh, approachable, blah, blah, blah. Mike. Can, so what do you guys think of that? Can I jump into that? Mm-hmm. So I think he's talking about basically the plight of an illustrator, <laughs> the balance, <laughs> right? I mean, like, yeah, like we work for other people and we, we work on their dreams. Meanwhile, we let our dreams stagnate sometimes. And I think the, the, the success, super successful illustrators do one of two things or both, which is they, stop advertising or stop looking for or stop agreeing to work for the clients that are taking them in the wrong direction and start accepting jobs which are in line with their vision. So the books that I take on now are pretty much all dream jobs. They're they're stories I wish I had written and I get to illustrate. The other uh, the other side of it is they end up doing their own personal projects and it could be a combination of the two. So I think over time, like yeah, I took so many jobs that I hated <laughs> early on that, uh, and I describe it as it's worse than working on an art job that you hate is actually worse than doing the worst manual labor job I could think of. Right. You'd rather paint. Um, yeah. Because your, it takes emotional labor. You <laughs> cannot escape from it. When you're digging a ditch, you can think about, you can be anywhere, but when you're forced to work on art that you hate, 
you were there, you're present the whole time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's another, I mean, that's, it's totally true. And I, I, I always use this analogy in school too, to add to what Will said. It's my, my tennis analogy. I love using analogies for some reason when I teach, because it just <laughs> makes it easier to kind of see the perspective of it all. But just being, a lot of people think, oh, if I was just a pro, I'd be happy. And if I was just making a living at this, it would be so much better. And so I use my tennis, this tennis analogy, um, for the kind of the mentality of what it takes to be a pro at something. If you, I enjoy playing tennis just as much as anybody does, I guess, recreationally. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you play recreational tennis, it's pretty fun. You go out, you swat some balls and whatever. Then you start to get a little bit better at it. You go, Oh, maybe I'll play some like, you know, little neighborhood, little weekly round robin tournament or something. And so the level goes up a little bit, starts to become a little more serious. You start working on shots. It's still pretty fun though, but you've changed it from that initial easy, you know, whatever kind of attitude. Now you got a little bit of criteria that you're trying to do and a little bit more seriousness. And then you, you start winning that and you're like, okay, I'm going to play maybe some regional tournaments. You maybe get a coach at that point, man, things shift quite a bit. And now you, now practice comes into play and, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the, what, what is always fun is not, the focus anymore. Now you have to go, you know, I got to work on this shot. I don't like doing this shot, but I got to work on it because I'm, I'm losing points to it, you know, and then it's just more serious. And then, you know, the next step is, okay, I'm going to be a pro tennis player. And now it's for real. You know, you got to start measuring your serve speed and all this stuff. And the fun is, I don't want to say it's not fun, but it takes a different kind of person to go through all those steps and say, I'm going to, I'm willing to do all this sacrifice for being a pro. And, it comes with a lot of ups and downs in terms of your enjoyment, your relationship to that job. And I feel like illustration is the exact same way. Um, and I've heard, I heard a writer talk about that with her relationship with writing before. And during this lecture, she said, you know, my relationship is just like a relationship with a husband or a family member. Like sometimes we're good. Sometimes I love my writing, but sometimes I hate my writing. I don't want to even look at it. I don't want to talk to it. I don't want to, I don't want to even think about it. And other times, you know what I mean? It's just kind of bendable thing. So it just becomes different when you become mm -hmm. a pro. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway. Yeah. I think uh, you have to find that job that matches um, your inclinations, your drive, and your uh, ability level too. So it, it might be that, like Mike says, um, uh, you don't want to wallow in the shallow end of the professional, you know, the professional world. Uh, and who knows what, for whatever reason, that, that could cause that. It could be your ability level. It could be, you know, certain uh, drive or it could just be time constraints or whatever, you know, maybe you don't want to move to a, a, a different place and there's just not the jobs where, where you live. Uh, but I have a, I have a friend who um, was trying to make the art career work and, and what he ended up doing was teaching art to um, junior high students and loves it absolutely loves it because it allows it gives him so much creativity in the projects that he wants to do with the kids uh in his own projects gives him time to do his own projects because he, he has summers off you know so like that was a great compromise for him that maybe he doesn't have to be working for like a high profile studio maybe it's something that that he didn't initially like think would be an option but now is this thing that he loves to do so yeah Man, that was like its own topic. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and get into the real topic. Okay. Wow. Next, next all right, this is jam-packed episode for everyone. Uh, all right, Will, this is this is your day today. You're driving, so okay. I'm, I'm handing the keys to you and and take us wherever we're going to go. Ooh, hopefully, we don't wreck. I hope so. We get a lot of questions uh, at SPS about you know, can I pay for a critique of my portfolio or? Will you give me feedback on this? Or are you going to have offer a critique class? And I, I wanted to address that first because a lot of our students listen to our podcast and uh, we don't often get a chance to talk to them in one place. We are trying to build SVS right now in the curriculum. And so we have taken kind of a backseat on just doing critique classes. And it's been frustrating for some of our students because they want it. They're just dying to get a good critique, to just know how they're doing. We all do, right? I mean, we all want to know where we fit in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in general, I want, to, I want to give in this podcast ideas, alternatives on where to get a critique, how to get a good critique, and how you can prepare yourself to get a critique, what not to do, what to do, all, all of that we're going to unpack 
that whole thing. Um, cause I don't think that, uh, you need to wait. And I think there's some proactive things that students can do or, or beginning artists can do to ensure that they're getting good feedback so they can move forward. So let's dive in. The first thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, why do you want or need a critique? Why do you guys, what, what would you guys say? Why, why should a student get a critique of their work? I mean, maybe some people don't want one. It's impossible to know where you stand without getting a critique. You have to see it from other people's point of view. And that goes all the way up into the pro level. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've showed, you know, my studio, I shared a studio with David Hone for years and show him something and, and he'd spot something I did not even see. And it's like as obvious as the nose on your face when somebody else sees it, especially somebody exactly. who knows what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm the same way. In fact, recently I, I self critiqued. I, I, I I was doing the cover for Skyheart and I was something just wasn't sitting right about it for me. I didn't like the character designs because I'd I'd evolved as an artist since uh the style had evolved since I, I did the the cover. I drew the cover first before I drew the comic. So I'm like, I gotta redraw this cover with the right character design. So I did it, I inked it, I colored it, I showed it to Will, and Will's like, Yeah, man, that's good. Ship it. <laughs> I'm like, sweet. I posted online and you would not believe the the feedback I got. Like most most of the time I post something and people are like, yeah, this is good. But I posted the old cover next to the new cover. And so many people were saying, Oh, the old cover's so much better. The old cover's so much better. I showed it to my kids and they were brutal. They're like, like, this one's Garbo, <laughs> this one's a masterpiece, pointing to the old one. And so then I realized, like, okay, A. Don't ask Will T- Terry for critique. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny when you came in, when I came in the next day and you're like, what did you say? You're like, did, did you read? Uh, what did I say? You said something like, so did you give me an honest critique on yeah, yeah, the cover? Exactly. <laughs> I was busted. And the busted. reason that I didn't, and this is going to come up in, and we're, we're going to address this, mm-hmm. is... Um, I was hedging for you because you went ahead and did a completely finished piece. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that you're like, I know how I feel Mm -hmm. when I do spend all that time. I want to use that time. And you, you didn't really, I'm going to blame you when really I should just take the blame. I should just take it. Right. (laughs) Yeah. You didn't give me the permission I was looking for to just, hammer you on that right over so i should have i should have said i need an honest critique will i need <laughs> you to tell me is this good or not instead of just what do you think yeah that's yeah. a good point so okay so moving along that was awkward when it happened because i was busted <laughs> and i did have to come clean and say ah oh, you know i really like the old one better and here's why but at that point we kind of and you're, we were in a safe space to be able to to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get going on preparing the critiquer to give you a good critique, I want to talk about like places where people can actually get a good critique of their work. I think a lot of times students are afraid to ask um, their current teachers or past teachers for a critique. You know, they, they they're out of college, they're out of art school, or they're out of high school. They've lost touch. And I think in general, most of us are, I don't know, somewhat introverted to where, you know, it's hard hard for us to reach out to someone. But I, I would say you probably already have, a lot of people probably have access to people who could actually give good feedback, but maybe they're not as convenient to get a hold of. So I would start there. Um, I have given quite a few professional critiques to strangers who happen to catch me at the right time or ask in the right way. And um, I'm able to work that into my schedule via email or something. And so if you can ask professional artists, a lot of times you're going to get ignored if you don't know them, but that's a good resource. Can I add something to that? Will? yeah, yeah, go ahead. One thing about that one, asking prior instructors for feedback is your relationship with them during your class when you're actually in the class 
is going to set up that relationship for them to want to critique you later. That's a good point. And so, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes students, I haven't seen them for two or three years and they send me an image and I couldn't be happier to look at the work. I'm, I'm excited to see what they're doing now compared to when they were in school. And I'm excited to, to be able to still help them out. Um, likewise, sometimes I get, you know, I hear from students a couple years later in class, they were combative. They were late. They didn't turn in work. And then they asked me to critique something and I typically don't even respond to the email. I just can't. So, yeah, that makes sense. So basically be a good person. <laughs> be, be involved, you know, I mean, because it goes, it goes way farther than the class you're actually just sitting in right now. Yeah. I mean, I, we just had just, just to speak to that point, we just had a student, I had a student who, uh, this is about five years ago. She was an awesome student, did a bunch of independent studies with her. Uh, we invited her to, to do a class here at, at the at the school that we run, SVS. She did the painting class um, and, and just showed her process. And then she just won the Adobe uh, internship. Mm. And so it's just cool to watch this. I mean, I couldn't I, – I recommend her all day long because she was so good – during my time with her. And so, I don't know, it just, it just lasts, the relationships last a long time, longer than just one class. I have a lot of former students that I would consider friends now, you know, Mm -hmm. and we we hang out on a professional level now. Yeah. Um, Like it or not, I just want to add too, like it or not, we live in a transactional society. And that means if you're asking for something like a critique to, a current or former teacher, especially a, a professional who doesn't even know you, um, it helps if you are giving them something in return. So for me, um, you know, a lot of times people come up to me at comic book conventions. I'm at the table uh, and and they'll hand me my, my their portfolio and say, would you mind taking a look at it? I'm more than happy to give a critique, but if it gets in the way of a sale, I'm there to 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 make money. I'm taking time out of my weekend away from my family. Um, you know, I've invested a lot of money and time into this show. And if the portfolio reviewing is getting in the way of of my reason for being there, um, the portfolio review isn't going to go as well. Isn't going to be as thorough as if the person says, "Can I buy a print?" And can I have a little bit of your uh, time to look at this portfolio? So that always helps. And and I think also if it's a, a teacher or some sort of mentor, is there something I can do for you? Can I come in and update your website for you? Can I handle your social media posts for a month? You know, can I do something that saves you time so that you can use that time to give me a good review, a good critique. So I think if you come into it with that, you're going to get a better critique and you're going to understand a little bit more about the the, the nature of, of what it's like working professionally and trying to take out time to give back to others uh, and being able to facilitate that for, for people. So what if they buy five prints? Do they get like, you know, a full portfolio? They get Jake <laughs> for a weekend. Yep. I come to their house. I make them breakfast. We sit down, we chat. <laughs> okay, so some other suggestions would be um, art buyers at conventions. And the, by conventions, I'm talking about like the SCBWI conventions, which are in the children's book world, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Pause. Um, yeah. I Before you get into that, there's one more other thing <laughs> that I want to yeah. mention. So say you don't have access to a prof- professional. Say... Um, current teachers or former teachers isn't an option. Say you just have your your peers, right? Or a critique group or something like that. It helps so much to be the person that's always willing to give critiques so that when the time comes that you ask for a critique, people are more willing and likely to to share that with you. I, I, it, it's frustrating to see someone come up to, maybe it's like an art forum, like the SVS art forums. It's their first post you know, they're there with their portfolio or with an image and they're just like, please critique this, show me how I can get it, you know, make this better. Um, and, you know, people out of kindness will, will give critiques, but have that person showed up and for two weeks gave critiques to other people and then asked for a critique, I'm sure that critique would be much more thorough, would be mm-hmm. much more personal and probably get a lot better feedback than just uh, having a, you know, give me, give me attitude. Yeah, you never want to invite the revenge critique, right? Exactly. Right. 
I haven't heard it called that, but that is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted no, to get cool. that in before you moved on to the next. There's thing. there's a lot of different professional conventions. I don't want to go into all of them, but um, in your in the area that you're going to be working in, um, there will inevitably be a convention that you can go to, and there will be art buyers there mm-hmm. who will who one of their jobs there is to review portfolios, either to you know I mean they're they're head hunting basically, and so they want to look at good portfolios. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time there. Uh, another one would be like Jake kind of mentioned pro, pro artists at conventions such as like comic conventions or art shows. It's kind of an, wouldn't you say it's kind of an unwritten rule that artists kind of know that, that, uh, up and coming artists are going to approach them with their portfolios or sketchbooks. And yeah, I think, I think that's a little bit a part of it. It definitely was more a part of conventions before they became so uh, popularized. Mm. So a lot of times you'd go to a a comic book convention because you wanted to meet a comic book creator. And, you know, that's still an element of them. But for a lot of people going to conventions these days, it's to meet an actor. It's to meet, you know, whether it's a voice actor or the the cast of Star Trek, the next generation or, or something like that. So, uh, and I've, I've seen artist alleys sort of dwindle as in a lot of these shows and a lot of these shows that are happening now. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's still an element and it's something that, that I think you're completely in, you know, in the right frame of mind if you're going to a convention to meet an artist creator to get some of their input on your, on your portfolio. Mm-hmm. But like I said, just make sure that you are aware of of the things happening at their booth and the time of others and their time and see if there's a way that you can compensate or give back for that. Yeah. Can we go back to the revenge crit idea for a second? (laughs) 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 Just brought up, sorry to derail, but it just brought up this fun, I haven't thought about it since I left school, but (laughs) there was this one crit I was in. Um, It was right when I was, we were senior level and getting ready to leave. And I remember, um, you know, we're getting our portfolios ready for real work. And, and this girl put up this image and we're talking about it and everybody's critiquing it and stuff. And it was fine. But I just noticed, and this is where you should shut up sometimes when you're critiquing someone else's work. But I just noticed that she had done this painting and in between these characters and whatever was happening in this scene, the negative space of the painting, she had accidentally drawn a perfectly rendered dog. <laughs> so it's just, I mean, there's no dog that's supposed to be there. It was just the shape of like one leg coming down and another arm coming up, but it was so perfect. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and so, and you know, like a curb in the background was making like the paw anatomy and stuff. And, <laughs> wow. and so I pointed out this dog and for the rest of the critique, nobody could talk about anything but this accidental dog <laughs> that was in the negative space of this painting. And man, she was fuming. So when it was her turn to critique you. Oh man, she unloaded. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's a good one. So a few other ideas I want to touch on are the, the critique group. If you've never heard of one of those, we're going to talk about that just a little bit later in this podcast on how to form a critique group. Uh, but that's a thing. And it's a thing that people regularly form either if they're authors or if they're illustrators or both. Um, and then the the last one that I have on my list here is uh, social media groups. So I've seen a, quite a few Facebook groups that people will form that are kind of a private group. You know, I, you wouldn't want to just have an open critique of your work unless you like have like the toughest leather skin possible, you know, to put out on the general Facebook. But uh, in private groups, uh, you can get critiques. So the next thing I want to talk about is how to get a good critique of your work and are you are you personally ready for a good critique right so by that i mean I, I, let me ask you guys what what would a person who's ready for a critique act like what what would be signs obviously jake wasn't ready the other day <laughs> <laughs> well i think they would i th- i think you got to be ready to to put out what you want to get out of the critique. I think it's one of the problems that a lot of students do when they submit their work. They just kind of shove an image in front of your face and be like, 
here's an image. What do you think? And the problem with that is the the critiquer doesn't know what to do with the image. They don't know what the concept is or where you're trying to go with it. So it's really, really hard to critique when we are just left with nothing. So coming to the table mm-hmm. with saying, hey, I'm trying to make this layout. I'm trying to make it really scary. It's part of this story, you know, one or two sentences about kind of where you're going with that piece. And does this accomplish that? You know, just just mm-hmm. changing how you go into it. A lot of people are just basically going into cr- crit hoping that that the instructor says, this is a perfect image and there's nothing that needs to be added to it. <laughs> but I like having right. a frame of reference for how to yeah. how to critique it, like what they're looking for. Yeah, you need to, you know, like, you first need to know exactly what you're needing. And I remember I, I'd finished something and I knew it was good. I didn't need a critique. <laughs> <laughs> All I wanted was validation. I just wanted someone to say, oh, I recognize that you spent a lot of time on this. It looks good. You did a good job, you know? And, uh, and, and because I knew that that's what I wanted, I could ask in a way that I could get that. Right. And that way was, Hey friend, I was talking to a friend of mine. Um, I spent a lot of time on this. I just need to, I just need you to acknowledge that I created this, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's funny that you bring that up because our good friend, Mel Milton, who I think a lot of people listening to this would know who he is, but you should look him up. We'll put him in the show notes. Mel Milton. He uh, was teaching at our local university at UVU this last semester. And he told me that whenever he gets people coming up to him saying, uh, you know, will you critique this? He just gives them a glowing, he just gives them nothing but praise because he's had so many times where, you know, he's given an honest critique and then the person's just broken down (laughs) Falling, <laughs> you know, so he actually uses the the good critique as a measure, right? So he's mm. so if if the person goes, okay, yes, you, you're saying good things about it, but but and then invites him by saying, you know, but what's wrong with it? What what could I do to make it better? Then he's like, oh, you actually want to critique, you know, you know, or he's actually had people before that are like, you don't ever give me a critique, how come? And he goes. And he'll tell them because you've never really asked. And they're like, yeah, sure mm-hmm. I do. I ask. And they're like, not really. You know, like you, you have to invite me and make me feel safe. Because haven't you guys, have you guys ever given a critique and had someone just start crying in front of you? You know? Oh, yeah. Every like, class. And that's awkward. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, or I've had people get mad. I had somebody on Facebook one time uh, who messaged me privately and said, and I just took them at their word. They just said, I really want an honest critique of this, blah, 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 blah. And I, I gave them an honest critique. And, and my way of critiquing, I'm not on a scale of, you know, harsh and easy. I'm definitely more on the easy side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I gave them the, you know, the level four critique. And I got the response I got back was, wow, who do you think you are? Kind of a thing, you know, and just, and from then on, this person, you know, wrote me off and was mad. And I think we're all, as a, as a person giving, being asked to give a critique, and this is all of you listening because it doesn't matter what level you're, you're at, we all give critiques and we all need critiques. And the, 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 one of the things that I think you guys are alluding to is that um, the, the person asking for their critique needs to prepare the critiquer. Is that a word? Yeah. It yeah. needs to, you need to make the person you're asking feel comfortable that they're not entering into something they didn't bargain for that day. You know, like when they woke up in the morning, they're like, I hope I get into a fight with somebody today. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. they, they want to avoid that. So I have a, a few things, what not to do and a few things that you can do. One, um, things, behaviors not to do person asks for a critique and then they won't shut up <laughs> like almost as if they're blocking any possible negative negative mm. comments that could come have you guys ever experienced that one? Oh yeah. yeah so it's like hey can you look at this piece and you're like sure l- just let me know what you think so as i was working on it this is the thing that i was doing <laughs> and then i did this and but then i messed up so i went back in and made the, and you just can't get a word in yeah and so you're, so you're like going oh at, at that point i'm thinking 
okay, you wanted to be acknowledged for the hard work mm -hmm. that you did. And so I'm not going to give you a critique. Another one would be the person asks for a critique and then gets completely upset. We talked about that. Another one is uh, the person is distracted during the comments. You know, so you're you're giving nuggets of gold as the critiquer, and they're off in some other world. It's like, oh, okay, they're, they're on their phone. <laughs> yeah, they're blocking the negative negative comments or the feedback by being unplugged, arguing. You know, arguing with the with the feedback that you're getting, um, and and you could be getting bad feedback, right? We've all gotten critiques that are that are bad. My advice for that is, um, you know, get multiple critiques on the same piece. If you don't hear the same thing, the same sorts of comments more than once, it could be, you know, that the comments are wrong that you're getting, right? Yeah, so those are those are behaviors uh, that I would say are repellent for getting a critique, good critique. Uh, what would be Lee? What would be some things that you would would say a, a person wanting critique should do to prepare? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, one of the main things: know what you're gonna know what you want out of the piece. So know what you want to hit during the critique. It can't just be, what do you think of this image? So being specific on things you want to work on in the piece or things that you're wondering about in the piece. But my favorite is uh, going back to the story that um, Jake was talking about with his covers. If you have more than one option, life is going to be so much easier for you because even the, the, the people who are uncomfortable about giving a true critique, once there's two options, an option A and a B, then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they feel very free and saying, Oh, I like B because mm. A doesn't really feel this way to me or, or B feels perfect to me or whatever. Um, it's hard to just show one thing to somebody and have them either A, know what to do with it. Um, but once you have something to compare it to, man, the whole world opens up because they can say, Oh, wow, look what you did here. If you just do more of that and the critique just becomes so much more productive. So have more than one option. Um, to crit and, and then, and then know what you want to get out of the critique critique. And if you do those two things, uh, they'll, it'll be very, very productive. I think. Yeah. I would also say, be like specific. What, what did I nail in this piece and what did I get wrong? You know, looking mm -hmm. at this, what, what could, what can improve? Mm. Another thing you could say maybe, or like, don't, don't, don't leave it as this monumental task. Say, what are three things I could do to make this piece better? Yeah. Instantly, I hear, I have to give this person three things. They want three things. Mm -hmm. They're not going to cry when I tell them three things. <laughs> right. There's a, there's a bar, there's a, yeah, an exchange that you've set up for that. I love that. Right. Yeah. Right. That's good. You know what I used to do with the people that argue with me, by the way? What's that? During critiques, it was always it always works so well, and I don't I don't want to be mean and keep arguing with somebody because, like you said, maybe I'm wrong, and that's what I when somebody starts arguing with me. Um, I mean, I've got definite reasons about why I'm saying the things that I'm saying, but maybe I'm, I've been wrong before for sure. And so I said, let's test it. And so I make them give me like three keywords for what the piece is supposed to be about, and then we go out. I'd, I would go out in the hall. This is what I'm teaching at the university, and I would just find the first four or five people that come up and I'd say, give me three words on how this makes you feel. And if, and if they didn't match the keywords, you know, the sentiment of the keywords, um, typically the student would be like, okay, I see what you're saying. It didn't communicate effectively and just mm. do this kind of like random, you know, unbiased person. The person doesn't know we were just arguing in class about what to do about it. And it kind of, and almost 95% always worked in my favor that way. Yeah. Sometimes I was wrong though. So, and, and they would say, mm. yeah, it works perfect. I'd be like, yeah, man, I'm just not seeing it, but you know. I do a version of that that goes something like this. I ask the rest of the class, you know, we would come up with the with the basically the keywords, you know, what are you trying to say? The student would tell me, and I would ask the class, if we showed this to random people in the hallway, do you think they would come up with what this student just said? And everyone's kind of shaking their head no. You know, <laughs> it's a reality check, you know, because you I think you go through these phases as a, as a, um, as an artist, you know, at first you're just tickled that you can make a piece of art and then you're tickled that you can make a piece of art look sort of like what you had in your mind, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those two first stages, all you really want is praise. And it takes someone, I think 
for me at least, deciding that they want to do this professionally to where they start going, they start coming to the reality of, I may not, I may fail in this endeavor if I don't get good. And they have to get tired of their current level of production to the point where they surrender and just go, hit me. You know, I can take it, you you know. And another question that I love that I've heard people say before is they've said, I'm willing to start this piece over. Yeah. If you think that's what it needs. Oh, that I'm free to tell you exactly what I think now. Yeah. And that is the, that's where you're going to learn so, so much quicker. Like a lot of pieces can't be reworked. They're designed in such a way poorly to where, uh, you know, it's like a, a plane that's in a dive that it, it's not going to be able to get out of. It has to crash and you have to build a new plane and start over again, you know. You and guys, do you guys know what rubrics are? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So any any professional teacher yeah. probably knows what a rubric is. But for those of you guys listening, a rubric is a way of of analyzing something in, under multiple um, multiple criteria. And so that's the way. Did you guys grade with rubrics in, in college? Sort of. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have basically a call. It's not just like you get one grade, you turn in an illustration. It's just, oh, it's an A or it's a B. It would right. be, uh, your, your process would get a grade and then your, uh, your inking would get a grade and your rendering would get a grade and your story gets a grade. And so it comes out there, you know, there might be five to seven, five to 10 categories within a piece and you could see exactly what you did right and what you did wrong. And that's a good way to do it too. If you come in and, and, and ask about each of those things specifically. Because then it isolates yeah. where the price, it's not all just like, oh, this is a terrible piece. You can say, oh, the inking no. is great on this and the perspective right. is great, but the concept's not really working so well. And so you find exactly kind of where that category is that's not working as well. Yeah. Right. And that's what any time I critique, I, I go through four different things. And it's all from like fundamental stuff to the more superficial things. And I always start with, well, let's look at your, you know, let's look at your gesture or your under, under sketch, you know. Uh, maybe it's the composition or something like that. Then let's look at um, let's look at your design work. You know, maybe maybe gesture is great, but the design is stale. You know, uh, and then I just move down those things to you know how are the volumes? How is it structured? Is it field dimensional? If that's what they're going for, and then finally, like how is it actually rendered? And it could be that everything's good up to the rendering, and it's like if this was just rendered differently, it would be a, an amazing piece. You know, so it's, it's going through those checklists for me mm-hmm. and looking at those things and, and deciding what, you know, what it, it's like, if they're willing to start it over. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> Cause then you can go back to the beginning and say, here's how you, here's how you do it. But, um, sometimes it's just like, what's the minimum thing you can do to like change it for the better. And it might just be like, well, this eye's wonky, just fix that eye, you know? Yeah. I think that if you're going to be wanting a critique, you're also going to be needing to give a good critique. So, you know, thinking about, for me anyway, the purpose of the art, since, since we're not dealing, we're not talking about gallery work here. We're not talking about personal work. We're talking about at most, for most, uh, uh, for the practical sense of this podcast, we're talking about commercial art, right? We're talking about, uh, illustration. And so there's always going to be a purpose for that illustration. It's going to be to um, convey a, a story or an idea, a concept. And that is my number one question is, does this, does this say basically what you were saying, Lee, does it say what you're trying to say? And right. that's, to me, that's more important than, um, than the aesthetics, even though the, the, to me, the aesthetics comes are you know, really close second, but I don't want to get into the color and the, and the uh, rendering, if the concept is not going to work, even if the color and the rendering were, were fixed. Right, right. And I guess that there's a flip side to what we're saying here. And that is, you know, from the student's perspective, how do you recognize a bad critique when you're actually getting a critique that's not worth it? And, and yeah. what I would say there, and there, that's happened a, a lot in my schooling, both undergrad and graduate school. Um, a specific example of that my, my friend, won't mention names here, but uh, one of my friends was in his grad program and turned in an illustration and it was a high key image because, and it was high key, meaning that the values are at the high end of the scale. It's not a full contrast image. Um, and it was a, 
for a reason, but like that just hit what he was trying to say in this in the story by making the image high key. So he puts it up there, and then the critique is, oh, well, you need to add more values. And he's like, well, I made it high key because of this point in the story. And they're like, well, <laughs> you, you don't have all your values here. <laughs> and it's right. just kind of ridiculous where they start talking about these little things that don't matter. And they're not asking you, the student, uh, the questions like, what do you want me to think? And how, how are you conveying these things? And, uh, it's, it's amazing. You can just, if they just have a certain go to, like you have to use full value. It's got to be fully rendered. Uh, they don't ask you any questions. That's how you know your critiquer is, is less than stellar. And maybe mm. it's time to ask someone else. Yeah. I think if you come into it and say, this is my intention with this piece. This is what I was trying to accomplish. You know, let me know if this, if this is doing it or not. And then you can, then you can tell if the person's just being subjective or if they're being objective, like, okay, subjectively, I don't like purple and yellow together. I think that I, I'd prefer blue and orange. Right. But that is like a subjective thing. It doesn't matter. You know, if the colors are working, it doesn't matter. But if they say, you know, this purple with this particular yellow flattens out your piece. And I think you're going for, you know, you said you're going for more contrast. Then you're getting something more objective and something you can actually respond to. Right. Right. That's good stuff. Um, okay. So how do you, um, what, what can you do to receive a critique? Like, how can you prepare yourself for that? Like, yeah. How can you like, internalize right. what's been said to you. Because you're going to get hit in the gut, right? I mean, like, you're you're like, hit me. That's basically what you're saying. Hit me hard. Yeah. I can take it. So I for me... Gotta, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you go in... This is how I started working in watercolor years ago, and it changed everything for how I hear, hear critiques of my work and all this, is that I go in when I'm going to do a finished watercolor, hopefully a great painting, but oftentimes not. <laughs> I go in <laughs> thinking, this is just a study. And that way it kind of calms me down. It loosens me up. And if I happen to hit it, awesome, I'm done. And if I don't hit it, then I say, oh, that was just a study. And this, that bendable mindset um, changed everything for like I, everything I do, like even almost to the finish, I turn it in. I say, here's almost like a, a, a clay version and we can still sculpt it. You know, if you go in with that right. bendable attitude that, that this thing can morph and it can change and I don't mind working and, and doing stuff over, then all of a sudden it's not that punch in the gut it's it's just changing you expected the change anyway and you're welcome you're open to it the mm. whole time mm -hmm. and it makes a huge difference in doing finished art by the way if you have that problem where you go to do your finished art sketch is good color study is good and then you tighten up when you're doing the finish this will solve that problem because you just everything's just a work in progress mm -hmm. until you're moving on to the next piece and it just it just frees you up quite a bit yeah hey jake when you were working at blue sky Mm -hmm. How often um, did you guys get, like get critiques on the stuff that you were doing? Oh my gosh, that was the entire job. Um, it, the whole thing was draw some, or receive an assignment, do a pass at it, get critiqued, do a pass at it, get critiqued. Sometimes, sometimes fifty times. I've seen I've seen the character design go through fifty iterations before finally like being approved. Um, and so that's, that's all it was. It's like, I think what you need to do is recognize, you, you know, the, the old saying, like everybody has a thousand bad drawings in them or 10,000 bad <laughs> drawings or 500 bad paintings. I don't know exactly what it is, but you want to get through those as fast as you can. So if someone says, you know, this is, this one isn't that good. You're like, sweet. I got one of those out of the way. I can do the next one. And I think the reason that I didn't, I didn't feel slighted at all by people saying they didn't like cover number two versus cover number one was because all in all, I probably spent 16 hours on it. 16 hours is nothing. Like I could do another 16 hours and do something a little bit better, you know, the next two days or the next three days. Right. Um, and, and, and 16 hours is nothing when you're having this point of view, when you have the perspective that, you're going to be doing this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? And I've been working now for 19 years, uh, almost 20 years in October as a professional. And I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of finished, polished drawings. And so if one isn't working, 
you know, it just gets thrown into the bad drawing pile. And I know um, there'll be another drawing the next day. So it's like, um, just, I think you just go into knowing like, this isn't the end of the world. This isn't the last drawing <laughs> you're ever going to create. So it's a volume. You get, you basically have developed scabs. You develop, yeah. and then muscles and... It's like worrying about the one brick as opposed to the entire wall that you're yeah. building. Yeah. So I think if you, to one way to prepare yourself for the critique is to really ask yourself what you want. Do you want, are you happy with your current level of art? Do you want to stay there? Mm-hmm. This is what, what I want to ask some of my students sometimes is like, you're upset that you're being told the truth and that everybody is kind of telling you the same thing, yet you're really upset. And so if you, if you unpack it even further, you're upset at the fact that you have to change to become better. And I mm-hmm. think sometimes how you frame it in your mind can actually really help if you can, if you can just surrender to the process and say, I'm here to get better. And all of this work that I'm doing this year, in a year or two, I'm not even going to care about it anymore because I'm going to be so much better. Yeah. And, and don't, don't get, don't get feedback from just one person. Kind of look at the, at the overall sentiment of what people are saying. Like Jake said, you know, like the, there's going to be a lot of people that will respond in a certain way. And if, or mm-hmm. maybe Will said it, but the majority of people start saying something, you got to listen to it. Um, yeah. If other- it was really good and insightful, I, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That means Will definitely said it. <laughs> well, yeah, this student at, at school, uh, who was a 3D modeler, and I don't teach 3D modeling, obviously, but he was in my senior portfolio class and I had to look at his work. And uh, he did this this piece that he worked on the entire senior year, and he never deviated from this one piece. Um, and it, it, you know, if you guys are familiar with 3D work, it had like 10 billion polygons in it. But he wanted to be uh-huh. a game designer, and that means it's just overly complex for being a game designer. This this character right. coming up out of this portal. It was his only thing and his whole thing. And so uh, my feedback was this thing looks too complicated. I'm not sure. If, I'm not an expert in, in modeling. So please go talk to somebody else. But it looks like you just got one thing and that's it. And, uh, and if somebody, if a client doesn't respond to this one thing, then you're not going to get a job. But he was so focused, like, like Jake said, on the one brick instead of the wall that he's like, he just wanted to keep polishing that one piece. So he goes to the modeling teacher. Modeling teacher says the same thing. This is great, but you can't use it in a movie or even in a game, uh, in a game, even in a movie, you can't use how many, how complicated mm. this thing was. And, mm. uh, and then, so there was like, uh, all, like four teachers are having lunch one day and we started t- kind of talking, you know, we always talk about students work and stuff. And, and this was an example. We all said the same exact thing to him and he never changed it. Um, he graduates and I didn't see him for about a year and a half and he came back and he was in tears. He hadn't got a single interview. He hadn't gotten anywhere from when he was in school. He hadn't done anything. And he's finally saying, Oh, I'm ready to listen <laughs> to what you guys are saying because he just, he just couldn't hear it. He was so micro focusing instead of getting this kind of general thing like, Oh man, there's like five teachers telling me the same thing. That's probably yeah. a pretty valid thing. Mm. When when the student arrives, the teacher will appear, right? Yeah, I think exactly. I, I created that. That's quote. A great. <laughs> <laughs> Can we finish up with talking about critique groups real quick? Yeah, I would love that. Sure. Okay, so for those who have never even heard of a critique group or who've never been a part of one, let's just talk about our experiences a little bit and what how how we how they form and how to be a good member of a critique group and maybe a few do's and don'ts. Um, I'll go first. So um, I've been in two different critique groups and they were both for writing. Um, I was sort of in one for illustrating, but I was already working professionally in that. And I didn't really feel like I needed the, the illustration one as much. Um, But basically my suggestion would be, to try to find in your area, I, I personally believe that it's better to meet in person if you can. And you want to find three to five people who basically have the same goals that you do. Um, you know, to become a published author, to become a published author illustrator, to become a published illustrator, something like as simple as that. And that becomes sort of your mission statement. And it's like one for all, all for one. You're going to help each other achieve this goal. 
And most critique groups that I've seen, they meet, they'll, sometimes they'll rotate and meet at the different people's houses. Um, and you plan on about an hour and you bring your work in progress and you basically share it with the group and the group gives you feedback. And, uh, so that, that's basically the, in a nutshell, the idea of a critique group. Have, have, have both of you guys been in critique groups before? Yeah, I've, I've done it before. I've been in a handful of critique groups. I'm currently, I would say in a handful of critique groups, though we don't call ourselves that. It's just, I have different groups of friends that I can share stuff with and they share stuff with me. And, and it's, it's, it's a great experience because you do get, you know, uh, you do get that feedback. Um, the, the hard part though is finding, you know, finding that right chemistry, um, because you want people to be honest and you want people who, you know, you, you should feel like you're the least, um, you know, the, was the least skilled person in the group, right? But <laughs> they can't work that way. Everybody has to be kind of at the same level. So, uh, so it it takes a little work, and and maybe you have to swap people in and out of your group or something. But um, I don't know how you do that without <laughs> hurting feelings. Like you can't come anymore. Your critiques are horrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't, we voted you out. Yeah, You're we off voted the you island. out. <laughs> but um, I'm uh, I've done in person. I've done online, and they both they both work pretty well. And one critique group didn't last very long um, because we just got busy, but one of them was we weren't all artists. We were all creative people, but doing different things. So one guy was making t-shirts. Uh, I was making illustrated books. One guy was making a, a board game. You know, And I just, we organized that because we wanted to see if maybe mixing this group together could influence our own work in, in ways we weren't expecting. So you might want to try something like that. How about you, Lee? Um, I say limit the number if you can, unless you're just posting images online. Like I'm, I'm part of a couple of Facebook groups where people just kind of post images every now and again. Um, and it, but it's so casual. It doesn't feel like a true critique group, group to me. Um, and it almost feels like a cheerleading group a little bit more than mm. a, than a crit group. And that's group. what they evolve into sometimes if there's not, if they get too big. Yep. That's then right. it becomes unsafe to stick your neck out and say what you really think. Exactly. And so I would say limit it to, if you can, three to f- four people would be tops. But and the, and the reason I say that is because yeah. to do real critiques takes time. And and yeah. if you're sitting there yeah. for four hours or something, you're not going to continue a critique group where you have that big of a bite out of your week or time time frame. So a couple of people, yeah. um, I think three is a perfect number for a critique group. Um, and then stay accountable to it. Um, we had, when I was in school, a weekly meeting that we would go to this cafe and it was like, I think it was probably five of us total in the group, but three of us met every time. And, Mm. um, and it was fantastic. It was such a great experience. And we, we knew that, you know, Wednesday at seven o'clock we're meeting at that cafe and you better have something to show because you kind of look lazy if you don't. Mm -hmm. And that, that accountability, um, really kind of worked out well. And I'm actually teaching it with one of those people that was in the group. J- Jamie Zollers was one of the people that I was with then, and she's a you know a great pro in her own right now. And it was, and we still you know have that relationship to be able to critique. So mm. it's you know been a critique group now that's lasted you know 15 years for me. <laughs> so I would say most I would venture to guess because I, I've we've talked about this at, at conferences before that almost I would say probably greater than 80 percent of the published authors and illustrators are part of critique groups. So you could almost say it's a requirement for getting published. If you're not in Mm -hmm. one, it's like, you know, you're not, you're not part of the fire. You're, you're off trying to light a flame on your own, you know, and it's, it's tough. Yeah. You know, it just made me think of something. It's so early in my career, uh, a group of us young 20 something artists got together to make a comic book anthology. And what that required was us to, none of us were like um, professional yet. We just, as far as comics were concerned, we were all either working in an animation studio or or whatever it was. And so we would all post our comics and give each other critique because we wanted this anthology to be good. And, and what I realized now is that wasn't, it was never called a critique group, but what it was, was this thing we're talking about where we gave each other time. We gave each other honest critiques because we knew that the anthology was only as good as like its worst comic, right? So if 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 we tried to elevate everybody, 
in the in the book, then the book would be better. And it was just super mutually beneficial. So maybe your critique group starts out something like that, where it's like a group project. Uh, I don't know. You're going to have to be creative and figure out what, what works for you. But maybe it's something like that where you all benefit from it. And then you can sort of splinter out and 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 go off and do your personal things. Um, was that but, Kazu's book? Um, yeah, it was the Flight Anthology. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So, what are some bad behaviors? Like, obviously, you've probably been in a group of people that do things that are irritants. Like, what would be those? What would be things not to do? The people who oh. speak up the most and then don't deliver on their own work kind of drove yeah. me crazy. So they so they don't show up with work. They got something they, to say about everything. <laughs> right. You have Negative. to earn the right to speak, in my opinion. Uh-huh. I would just say taking too much without giving. Yeah. And not showing respect to everyone, you know? Like that could be a bad thing. Like it may be that one person in your critique group is like a little bit of a star, maybe a, a little bit ahead of everybody. Mm. And not giving you know, the lesser people as much attention or love or appreciation as that, as that person. So Mm. that might, that might be, that might be something. The lesser people. Yeah. (laughs) Another one would be the person who's chronically late. Like there's nothing more annoying, right? Mm. You want to start. It's not like you want to wait for the, these people, but they're, uh, someone told me one time that being chronically late is the ultimate form of selfishness. I don't know. I think that was my wife. She said that. Oh yeah. About me. (laughs) (laughs) No, Um, she actually one day she's like, "Okay, Jake, I've made a decision, and this is to just overall help our friendship and our marriage. And that is, when I'm going somewhere, I'm just going to leave whether you're ready or not, (laughs) and you can figure out your way to get there." And I was like, wait, really? <laughs> and the first few times, she's like, bye, see ya. I was like, just f- five more minutes, five more minutes. And uh, <laughs> and she was gone. And I got the hint. And now I'm much more punctual. You're like chronically on time now. <laughs> yes. I yes. love the backstory. If, if you can somehow hit yourself to a person who makes you better. Do, a, oh, do man, that thing. It's just the best thing <laughs> i would be such a mess if it wasn't for her also don't be for, for back to critique group don't be overly negative what was that saturday Night live skit where with the the woman that's like always oh, debbie downer wasn't mm-hmm. it debbie downer something like that so, something like that anyway so yeah I've, I've i've been in a critique group where there's someone is just kind of always brings everything, everything they see is negative. They don't see any of the good in any of the work, especially in their own work too. Like don't be negative about your own stuff too. You know, yeah. have some, well, isn't some that, isn't that why you use the Oreo working. technique for critiquing? You guys use that where it's, you come is that in like the layer of yeah, layer top of layer, love? top layer of love, middle layer of crit, bottom layer of love. So you finish yep. with something good. You yeah. start with something good and give them something meaningful in the middle. Mm-hmm. Also described as people skills. I called it the yeah. sandwich. Still. <laughs> Oreo, Oreos are better than sandwiches. Right. That's my last, true. so my last piece of advice is when you're fighting with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend, that is the absolute best time to get a critique from them. <laughs> Cause they're going to be brutally <laughs> honest. <laughs> no, do not get a critique. Oh, I have something to say about your art. Let me have at your soul right now. You should just stop. hey one other thing though um and and this is i guess a form of a critique group or whatnot but if you're posting your art online and you're not getting any feedback from people first off posting your art online is a great way to get feedback people will be honest um so so i would do that in the event that you're not getting any feedback from people that in itself is a critique it means that your artwork isn't worthy of a comment, you know? So do what you need to do to get people to comment on your work. Do, do what you need to do with your art in order to make it, um, uh, you know, remarkable for someone to make a remark on it. And, uh, and I would, I would look to that if you're having trouble 
finding a critique group, making a critique group. You don't have access to professionals. You don't have access to a teacher or anything like that. Uh, still post it online, post in forums, post on social media, and you can definitely gauge how you're doing by sort of the public's response. Can I add something to how to be a good critiquer? Mm-hmm. That is understand, try to find, I mean, you know, just like you have to self-evaluate with your own work that you're doing and you're creating, you have to self-evaluate your ability as a, as someone who's giving a critique. And what that means is knowing your biases, knowing your mm. tendencies. Um, I have a natural bias against symmetrical work. I know that. Mm. Like if somebody shows me a layout, I already know that if it's symmetrical, they better get me on board in some way because I'm already <laughs> against it. So what <laughs> do you think of, uh, oh, go ahead. what do you think of Wes Anderson? Somehow he pulls it off. I don't know what it is about the <laughs> look that he does, okay. but there's something quirky about the way that he does. Uh-huh. I actually, I actually paused a whole movie just going through it going, why do I like this? Mm. But when other people, I think it because it's so intentional when he does it and yeah. so well designed um, that it's not a mistake. I mean, it's, it's, it's like I said, very intentional. Same thing with, yeah. um, the shining and, you know, the twins and the hallway mm-hmm, scenes. I mm-hmm. love them. They're, I think they're done so well, but just as a general rule, I kind of like, like I said, you got to sell me on it. And those two right. really sold me on that symmetrical. So I'm on board 100%. Um, say so I, I don't love anime I mean, I, and I've, I've developed the ability through conscious hard work to be able to critique it and not just instant <laughs> gut reaction. I don't like it, but it would be a great thing if somebody was trying to get a critique from me and they're showing me a truly anime inspired character for me to say, I'm not the best person here. Maybe somebody else would mm-hmm. be better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So really maybe before you ask for a critique, you kind of, you know, what are your, <laughs> what are your likes and dislikes biases and, you know, Stuff like that. That might be, actually, you should probably do a little bit of homework on the person you're asking for a critique from. Like, yeah, you know, you wouldn't ask someone who doesn't paint what they think of your painting. You wouldn't yeah. ask a person who works solely in pen and ink what you what they think of your watercolor. You know, yeah, and it so doesn't that, mean, that, it doesn't mean that they can't do that. Like, I love realistic mm-hmm. painting. I don't do realistic painting anymore, but I love it. And if somebody comes to me with a realist painting, I I, I love giving those critiques. So don't. Well, you can't I guess it. A, I guess it depends on the kind of critique you're wanting. So if you're wanting, like, yeah. how do I make this watercolor, you know, really pop? How do I make these colors look less muddy? Yeah. Ask a watercolor artist. But right. in the same breath, it's always nice to get someone who maybe isn't an artist, but just an honest person to to give you their gut reaction to your piece. So you'll get a lot of good critiques that way as well. And, and they might not be able to nail it. Like, you know, specifically say, here's what's wrong. They'll just be like, you know what? This, it is not working for me. You guys should email my seven-year-old son and ask for the <laughs> critique because he'll tell you exactly what he thinks with no training. That's what I tell him when he tells me he doesn't like painting. I'm like, you don't know perspective. That's <laughs> <laughs> you argue with the critiquer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So one last last thing that I want to How many say. more last things are we getting last, here? Yeah, we're getting a lot. Last, last, last pretty soon. <laughs> um, now it's, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit already, but I, I just want to say if you do feel like you're, if you're really unsure about the direction, but you respect the person, you just because the person's high up that you're getting a critique from doesn't necessarily mean they, they understand your complete vision. And I was told by a former rep who I really respected that I should change my whole color palette because they were, and she, and he actually gave me colors that were popular that year. <laughs> and this was before I, I mean, I definitely have an opinion. I'm laughing now because I have a definite opinion on following trends. At the time I was only uh, like five or six years into my career and I song, strongly considered it. And I started asking other people like, man, they, you know, they, rep is saying I should change my whole palette and the colors they're giving me are really, um, really, um, neutralized. And it just doesn't feel like me. Uh, what do you think? And I, I wasn't really getting good advice from other people. And I was really at a quandary for quite a while. And finally, you know, after, you know, sleeping on a few days, I think I finally just said to myself, you know, I talked to my wife about it and I just said, 
I need to stay true to my vision. And I'm so glad that I did. It would have been such bad advice for me to chase instead of trying to, to follow my intuitions. So, But how is that different from the student at, at Lee's school with the, the model that four different teachers told him? <laughs> You yeah. got to change the model. I mean, in the end and of the day, he's just stuck to his vision. Right. At the end of the day, we're talking about art. There are no right and wrong answers. Right. False. <laughs> <laughs> we're finally going to disagree on something. <laughs> Here's the thing: if I'm going to disagree with that, if you're getting okay, I guess here, here's what it is: if you wanted to get work that year from that uh, agent or rep. And they're saying, listen, I can sell your work if it's these colors. Then that's a critique you want to listen to because you want to get work. But if your vision is, you know what, I'm building a career, not, I'm not trying to make a paycheck this year. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to, to, I'm building an overall career and a body of work. Then you can take or leave it. So I think definitely knowing what you're, you're wanting out of the critique to, uh, will depend on, whether you take that critique or not, whether you, whether you well, also, and is, is it, it a chorus not. of people saying the same thing again, that's just one right. person and one person doesn't matter. But if it was everybody yeah. saying that, yeah. you'd yeah. probably pay attention. Yeah. Right. Which is like with, again, going back to my sky heart cover, you know, two people were like, Oh, I love it, Jake. It's so good. 10 people were like, you know what? I, I like the first one better, Jake. And, and it got to the point where I was at first I was like, uh, these people know what they're talking about. The new one's better. And then by the end of it, I was like, the people who liked the new one, I was like, these people don't know what they're talking about. I can't trust I can't trust these people. I have a sneaky suspicion that this is all one PR stunt for you, like new coke new coke. <laughs> <laughs> so explain new coke. Because oh, for those some of us So yeah. So back in the eighties, <laughs> I believe. Some of us weren't alive in the 80s. Way back when they had... Uh, Not on this podcast, they, but... We started me. having cars. They <laughs> um, Coca-Cola came out with new Coke. They were going to change the formula, and everybody freaked out. And so the speculation now is that it was all a PR stunt just to drive right. more... Oh, to keep the... So yeah, like, then that's when they made Coke Classic, and they right, just yeah, kept exactly. the same thing they, they were doing. To endear the company to its... Uh, you know, it's customer base. It was, we will give you what you want when the new right. Coke was never really going to happen anyway. That's the speculation. So my whole thing was make a new cover to get a conversation happening about my old, book. Make a new crappy cover. I right. wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> Shoot, I'm going to do that from now on. I got to say, I don't know about you guys, but the, the hardest critique for me it to hear about my own work is that something I did a long time ago was better. Like this exact scenario you're talking Mm. about. Cause every time you do a new piece, you want people to say, Oh my gosh, you're getting so good. You're so much better. And you know, you want people to love the new piece, right? Who likes taking a whole day or two or a week of their time and just chucking it in the trash can? Yeah. No one, (laughs) (laughs) no one. All right, let's wrap this up. Do you have one last thing, Will? Or is that, Last, last thing no. is go wrap it up, Jake. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been uh, me, I'm Jake Parker, and Will Terry, and Lee White. So you can follow my work at uh, mrjakeparker.com. You can follow uh, Will Terry at willterryart.com. No, willterry.com, mm-hmm. right? Someone deleted this on my notes, so I don't, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> shooting from the hip here. And LeeWhiteIllustration.com was where you could find Lee White. Uh, if you like this episode, please share it around. Subscribe to it on iTunes if you haven't subscribed to it yet. And leave a review. We, we love reading the reviews um, because they actually they help us know how to make the podcast better. So when we see what you guys are responding to, we know what we need to do more of. When you see uh, what people aren't responding to, maybe we understand what we shouldn't do. You can critique uh, us. As well. Yes, give us a critique in the in the podcast. Uh, so yeah, we'd love to hear what you think. If you're wanting to join in on this particular discussion, log on to the svslearn.com forum where we've posted 
this episode in its own thread. Chime in over there and let us know your thoughts. As always, we'll have all of this in the show notes with links to the things we talked about. Uh, a lot of people have been saying how much they love the show notes and that that's just as um, a much of or just they like the show notes just as much as they like the podcast as well. So check out the show notes. Those are either in the podcast app or on um, svslearn.com podcast link on there. And that's it. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Nailed it. Nailed it again.